Thank you. <laughs> and hopefully the real-time translation will do better when I'm standing in front of the screen. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming along. You're all awake, which after the party is phenomenal. Um, so uh, I will try and keep this exciting enough that only like quarter of you fall asleep. Uh, we've already done the intro stuff. Do tweet me if you want to follow up afterwards. Email me. Uh, oh, and I have laptop stickers for everybody who uh, made it out this time of morning on a Sunday. So see me afterwards for an extra hex sticker for your laptop. It's not an addiction, it's cool. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be talking today about whether we, uh, as data scientists, kind of count as experimenting on people. So then I'm going to move on to our ethical obligations, think about how do we put these into our processes, and then how do we tackle some of the technical challenges about it. So I take this, I work in industry, I'm not an academic, who is an academic? Okay. So I would hope most of you who put your hands up are kind of used to the idea of ethics and uh, on around researching on humans. Uh, but for the rest of us, that tends to take a bit of a backseat in business. So this might be new to some folks. Okay, so human subject research, which is basically researching about people and experimenting is working on real people, live individuals. If they're dead, <laughs> doesn't count. You can experiment on them differently. And you're generating and you're gathering data from three possible sources an interaction, an intervention, or data that they would usually reasonably expect to be private. If you're working with people and you're doing something to change how they're behaving or you're getting information from them from things like Alexa and analyzing it, you're doing human subject research. So I wanted to kind of think about this in the context of a couple of the most common kind of data science challenges, uh, the, the most common like business applications. So the first one is churn, which is basically working out who is going to stop using your services and maybe go to a competitor. And then you intervene. You maybe give them a voucher if you think they're going to leave, or you get give them an extra special phone call saying, hey, we love you, please don't leave me. Um, but we do something to try and change their minds. So we are doing an inter, we're changing their behavior. We are interacting with them to try and change things. We have a theory. And we test it in production on people, and we hopefully see more profit as a result. So for me, human subject research. Uh, PPC optimization, Facebook ad spend, that kind of thing. When we as businesses try to basically optimize uh, where we show up in search engines, and advertising uh, and kind of the ad space, again, we're distorting what people see and what they then will click on. Human subject research. Credit worthiness, when we work out who is going to, who we should basically have as customers in one form or another, we decide what financial products they get which then impact their lives. Recommendations, you know, if Netflix tell you to watch X, Y, and Z, 
uh, and you watch them and then all of a sudden you end up being recommended some more horror movies and just you end up you can end up down a really dark path of recommendations and this is a big issue with YouTube more than Netflix because uh, particularly for children the recommendation engine starts reinforcing all sorts of crazy horrible things that most people wouldn't let children watch uh, and it's because we're building things and forcing interactions. And then timeline ordering. So I always end up switching like Facebook and stuff to the latest view because chronological makes the most sense. But Facebook and Twitter, they're invested in trying to find you the most relevant social media posts. And Facebook did an experiment uh, without an ethics board to order that timeline and see if they posted more negative stuff, if it would actually make people more depressed. And it did. Show people lots of negative stuff and people feel more negative. So this is real world consequences. All of these things, when we do data science and we start building things, we're changing how people behave in a system. Fundamentally, we are experimenting on people, which, you know, first of all, we're cool, we're scientists, and then if you go out and say, I change how people think for a living, people probably start considering you to be evil. So, if we want to be a bit more um, rigorous about our treatment of our experimenting on people, researchers have a number of obligations when doing human subject research. So, they need to communicate that they're actually doing things, that there are interventions. So, Facebook should have told you that they are seeing if you're uh, experimenting with the ordering of your feed. The problem is, in a, from a business perspective, is that we don't actually want to tell people how we're trying to make more profit off of them, because people don't like knowing that you're manipulating them for your own ends. So. We have to kind of think about that. We have to respect the autonomy of the individuals. So if we override their decision-making capability and warp it, are we respecting that autonomy? The right to opt out. Anybody got APIs and automated decision-making inside their business that actually goes to a human if somebody says uh, they want a human to look at it? Anybody? Yeah, so also a GDPR requirement. <laughs> so I won't say how many people put their hands up. Uh, the benefits to the human you're experimenting on, it should outweigh the, the costs associated. So if you work out, you can get a higher interest rate from someone. If you change the path they go through your website first, you're literally increasing the costs for the person, but not increasing the benefits they get. They just get the same amount of cash to begin with. So we might be uh, quite often failing that duty. We get more benefits as a business, but is the individual getting more benefit? No harm. Again, if we up the rate, up the uh, loan uh, repayment rates, then we can make a loan unaffordable and then somebody can go into more debt and that can constitute harm. If we have medical machine learning and we fail to detect an issue and somebody ends up with more advanced stage cancer, for instance, we might be causing harm. Provide information about what you're doing. 
So we should be doing that under automated decision processes under GDPR anyway, but uh, it's often um, badly done or not done at all. And then protecting the privacy of the humans. Uh, so we, like I always want all the data. Before GDPR, my kind of general go-to was never delete, never surrender. I want all the data, give it to me, I'll work out what's interesting. The problem with that approach is um, if I fail in my duty to store that data uh, securely, then that data goes out into the world. So like the Equifax data breach, which put huge amounts of people's credit will be uh, out and available. So we need to be thinking about this as data scientists and also from the perspective of how we can avoid even seeing uh, like personally identifiable information when we're building models. Do we need to see the customer name to be able to build a model about how the customer behaves. So we do need to think about this. <laughs> and there's, uh, as well as kind of going from, well, you might be doing human subject research, you're experimenting on people, but we have a couple of reasons for this. So uh, we, Minority reports and kind of future crime and stuff. Predictive justice is currently uh, be in in production in a number of places around the world, where they're working out things like whether somebody will reoffend after prison and whether they should therefore go on parole. So. As we start seeing uh, Facebook adverts tailored by the photos that you've uploaded and predictive justice and it be machine learning being used to decide which universities you go to, uh, we need to be thinking about how we do all of these things in a safe, no harm oriented way so that we don't end up uh, kind of reinforcing uh, biases or implementing some and ending up in a bad place uh, in future. This was, uh, this is the most telling thing, one of the most telling videos for me of, uh, about why we need to think about diversity inside our solutions. So a bunch of people built a soap uh, dispenser and it worked on their hands, but not on people with skin of a different color. They had nobody in the design team, nobody in the engineering, nobody in the quality, in the QA testing, no business stakeholders in this process no beta testers who were not like the engineers. And so they built something that did not work out in public. And we have some of these issues around, um, did you see with Fitbit where you could, uh, where they made the data publicly available and it showed up a load of secret bases? Yep. That was funny, but it also, uh, things like that data being publicly available make it difficult for people in things like domestic abuse situations. So it ends up giving us a lot of risk because people aren't thinking about that when they build solutions. So if we start thinking a bit more rigorously about the ethics of our business projects, then maybe we won't accidentally find ourselves building solutions that don't work on the vast majority of people in the world. 
We should be rigorous because if we screw things up, we can destroy lives. So we were talking about this on Friday and somebody said it was just money uh, in the round table. But if you get blocked from access to finance, you can't often buy vehicles, you can't in the UK, you can't go to university because you can't get a student loan. You can't buy a house. You can't go on holiday and get credit card protection against your uh, uh, travel provider going bust. So access to credit is one of the key areas that we need to be careful of. And um, if we make mistakes, so the uh, Wells Fargo, their risk model, somebody screwed up when they were writing it a little bit, and more than 500 people got their homes repossessed when they didn't need to. Uh, the Bill Gates Foundation, trying to do very cool things like uh, get rid of malaria and things. One of the things that they did was they tried to make schooling systems fairer. So in the, they spent $600 million on trying to improve the uh, teaching in a school, uh, in a city schools primarily. So they set up a model about what looks like uh, a fair and high quality teaching process. And they scored schools and individual teachers on this. Some teachers ended up losing their jobs from it, and it was proven to have no actual benefit in production. Schooling did not improve after this 600 million pound initiative. People lost jobs, they, uh, but their model it wasn't actually any good. So we need to be pretty careful about the consequences of our actions. And the last thing that, if we think about this a bit more, is uh, we can actually do a lot of good in the world. We can, on, the, on like the medical machine learning side, if we do that right, we can help save lives. If we better price uh, credits so that it's as cheap as it needs to be for the person, but you still make a, an okay amount of profits, you give people a lot more buying power over their lives. We can do all sorts of things with machine learning and statistics and AI, whatever you want to call it. And that and Microsoft have um, seeing AI. So I love this seeing AI application. So again, in the US, all of the um, currency is all the same size and usually the same paper and everything. So it's very difficult for somebody with visual impairments in the US to be able to work out what cash they have. So the Seeing AI app is basically just a simple uh, object detection model that tells you, are you holding up a $1 bill or a $100 bill? and enables you to transact more safely without ending up losing money. And it does things like that, which we could all probably build after like half a day or a day of tutorial using R and maybe like YOLO or something. And we could do really cool things. So be, thinking about more ethical data science projects can help us feel good about ourselves. So what do we need to think about in business? The unintended consequences. So quite often I'll see people uh, use like overall accuracy as a measure for classification exercises. Like, hey, it's 99% accurate, but you've only got like, 
95% in the positive class anyway, so it's really easy to get 99% accurate. The problem is when they're getting it wrong. So common, the common thing that I think about is like if you're building a model for detecting whether somebody needs a biopsy for a potentially cancerous skin lesion or something, you've got two costs of getting it wrong. Your false positive saying they need a biopsy means that you cost the medical system more because they have to do that biopsy and then uh, you have some emotional damage caused to the person whilst they're going through this process of um, be, being worried. So there's costs on that side. And then the cost of getting it wrong is saying somebody doesn't need to go and have a biopsy when they do, kind of means that the cancer progresses more. So uh, the, the person's chance of dying goes up. And then it costs us more to intervene in that cancer uh, from the hospital, from the medical side. <laughs> so actually we have two very different costs and two very different sets of consequences. And as we build solutions, we should actually be trying to quantify those costs of those errors and look not at the overall accuracy, but at the detail leveled measures of precision, recall, sensitivity, and whatnot, and how our model interacts with the consequences. We also change behaviors. So with, like with Facebook's uh, timeline reordering, they make people more depressed. That trickles through their entire lives. So if we're changing how people see the world, what results people get, and um, even like how applications and things work because of our machine learning processes, we need to make sure that hopefully we're changing things for the better for the person. And we need to be particularly sensitive to the possible consequences of our models when we're dealing with finance, people's lives, and political stuff. Now, everybody heard about Cambridge Analytica? We need to be careful. <laughs> so, I feel like we have some responsibilities and some of these are definitely still kind of up for debate and I don't have all of the answers to ethics. This is something that every individual in the room needs to think about and every business needs to think about when you're what ethical looks like inside your organization. So the first thing that we need to do when we start building models is actually plan. I know it's not agile, but we should have a thought process at the beginning of projects where we actually think about the ethical, of, uh, the ethical implications of our project. This can be considered radical, this planning up front, but I think that's the least we can do. We can think about it. We should look at how we uh, help people operationalize our models. So if we build a uh, risk pricing mo a model for uh, credit cards, and the developers are implementing it, we need to help them understand that maybe we need a control group so we can understand how behavior is when we're not intervening in it. And we need to make sure that they understand that there needs to be an opt-out process. That is explainable, that the tools are there to help people uh, if they request information under GDPR about that automated decision-making process, that that's possible. 
Because a lot of the time, you might build something in a corner, which is nice and kind of abstract, but when it gets put into production, then it can turn into something a bit meaner. So we should think about it. The next thing is most of us, or at least in the UK, technology people are very rarely in unions and we do not have a professional body. There is no chartered data scientists. So some of the issues that we face is we might be asked to do unethical tasks. But how do we protect, what are our professional obligations to refuse to do unethical tasks? And what protections do we have? Like not everyone is going to be able to say, no, I refuse to do that because it causes, it, you know, that's their financial livelihood gone. When, somebody, when you get fired for whistleblowing or fired for refusing to do something. So we need to work out, and it's a very personal decision. If you're faced with doing something unethical, what do you do? What is your line in the sand? What can you do? And then we should be looking at monitoring. So we can't think of everything up front. But we should be looking at how we can check that our models that are in production are not accidentally causing harm. That they, uh, so again, like risk models for pricing, we could put it in and then we find that actually in production now 99% of all our credit cards are going to men. And that a high proportion of women are getting um, rejected the credit cards. We should have kind of monitoring for that sort of situation to make sure that we're not uh, inadvertently doing something bad. The responsibilities of the company. So hopefully most companies want to be ethical, but that's a difficult uh, thing to quantify. <coughs> so uh, organizations have legal requirements, right? <coughs> like um, GDPR, not pumping our food full of crazy chemicals, that kind of thing. So there's a minimum standard set up by the law that businesses need to adhere to. They also have a responsibility to generate value for their, usually their shareholders. This can distort behavior because when you're trying to get dividends paid out so that your shareholders don't kick you off the board, then you can end up prioritizing short-term profits over longer-term um, sustainability efforts. And becoming a little bit more common these days is being customer focused in terms of the value and the considerations. <laughs> so yes, we need to earn money for our shareholders, but should we be thinking about things in terms of the that more in terms of the value that we're adding to our customers? If we are continuing to add more value and we price appropriately for that, we should make a good profit. But we're not going out of our way to do harm to our customers. So that's an area where we can be thinking more about uh, things at a company level. So what are we going to do? One of the biggest things that we need to do is actually start talking about ethics on a regular basis. As uh, inside data science teams, even if it's just yourself, 
put it on the company Slack about a news story about data science gone wrong. You know, communicate that it is an important component of the workflow. You can run uh, ethics training workshops, and they, they have a really nice out-of-the-box one. So you can just spend half a day with key stakeholders to your data science team and get them thinking about ethics. And uh, at the end of these slides, there is a bit.ly link filled with like 50, 60 different links for further reading, including this link. So you'll get that. Think about the frameworks that you do data science in. So you might have, um, you might work inside kind of like an agile uh, ish development process. You might have a Kanban board for your tasks, which is kind of a fancy to do list with a limitation on how much you're allowed to multitask. Part of that process when you do a data science project, add in when you kick stuff off some assessments. You don't have to be overly detailed about it, but if you have a checklist that when you start a project, you have the, like, the key business measure, the critical success factors, the ethical considerations. You just have like five things that you need before you even kick off a project. That really helps. Checklists are wonderful. If you haven't, I highly recommend the Checklist Manifesto. That is a fantastic book that shows, uh, that goes into how checklists improve quality uh, inside processes. Uh, healthcare and aviation being two key areas of this. We should also think about how we can add tests or uh, and unit tests and um, monitoring capabilities around what we're doing to check that nothing goes into production that doesn't meet our standards. And you can adopt a code of practice. That can be very helpful. The saying this is this is how we work. This is what we consider to be important. It's also very worthwhile, and I'm not going to go through them, agreeing what counts as fair. So the concept of a meritocracy of everybody moves forward based on their uh, qualifications tends to uh, ignores the structural problem, any structural um, components which impact different groups' ability to achieve qualifications. So if we're building access to universities based off of those qualifications that they're getting, we would need to think about what is fair access. So if we were doing group unaware, we would just say you have to have uh, like three A levels at this amount to be able to get in. And that would that can reinforce the structural weaknesses behind the kind of like the upstream generation of data and the people. We could set different thresholds. So we could say, okay, for this group, it's three A levels at this level, but for this group, it's only two A levels. And the idea being that you start changing the distribution. And being able to discuss these before you start is really helpful because some people in the room will have a different definition of fairness. And if you can agree up front before you even start, what is the right one for you to do, this can help your projects go a long way. Okay. 
So, um, who's done data science on live customer data? Yeah. This, it can be a problem. So, often it might count as being used for statistical purposes. But as soon as then that data is being used to make processes change, you're using it for a different purpose. So we often need to be very careful about how we're using data. And usually we need to be a lot more careful than we are right now. We should be thinking about how we can anonymize the data. If we don't need to see the personal, uh, like the names and addresses of our customers, let's avoid that entirely. Let's save that from flowing through our data science processes. And we maybe want to consider consultation processes. So ask some customers. It's a novel approach, but go, if we, you, if, uh, so like in the case of Evernote, their data scientists said that they needed access to the notes to be able to test the quality of their models. They changed their terms of service and uh, there was uproar. But from my perspective, I know most data scientists and business intelligence people and data engineers and developers probably all have access to that data at any given point in time anyway. So it was nothing new to me to hear that, but customers were not fans. So we could have asked, what if we did this and got some feedback first and avoided a public scandal? Okay, so I'm gonna do some tech. One of the first things that we can do is synthetic data. So if you can avoid working on production data entirely, fantastic. So there is a package called SynthPop that will, you can give it your production data and it will generate similar records. The distributions will still be pretty much the same across uh, univariate and kind of bivariate, uh, sorry, multi-dimensional uh, distributions. But then we can give that synthetic data set to the data scientists. We can pr um, put that depersonalized data as uh, sample data inside our packages so that we can ship uh, research and capabilities. So synthetic data is a really great idea. And you can have this upstream of you. Uh, part of the uh, OpenSci Uncon, um, there was a set of vignettes on when doing exploratory data analysis, checking protected characteristics, for uh, bias in your system. If there, you, before you build a model, check and see if there's bias. If yes, have a discussion about what to do about that bias. That's where the notion of fairness will come in. Testing, so we really should have some stuff inside our processes that say before a model goes into production, is this going to meet our definition of fair? Will the consequences match up to what we expected? And a really good thing to do, and it's kind of from a marketing world, is the idea of a pen portrait. So a pen portrait or a persona is like a typical customer. And you might have different customer groups. So you have a portrait per customer, and you then say, my model would do X for Jane. 
and it would do y plot a mass. Is this the kind of outcome that we would expect? And is this reasonable? And then that takes, um, it's a lot easier for business people to then discuss the outcomes of your model. So you're not talking about like uh, RMSE scores or anything. You're saying here's the results for our, our 10 typical customers. Are you happy that we'd have done this in this situation? I've struggled to find our tooling for kind of this assessment of fairness and detecting uh, kind of bias about groups inside R. I'm always looking for suggestions. But there is um, Fair ML, which is a Python package. So we can, of course, call this with reticulate. Uh, and this helps us check our model. Very, very handy. Yeah. And then Google released this what if tool. So again, you, uh, it's open source. You can put this in front of one of your models and you can then check and see for different definitions of fairness and different cutoff points and things for your classification model, what the impact would be on usually like your test data set or your full training data set. And it gives you the opportunity to check counterfactuals. Basically, two customers who would be pretty similar but get different outcomes so that you can check and see uh, whether that is, again, a reasonable thing from a business perspective. Monitor. Uh, in production. Don't just ship a model, have the API working, and then never check it. It's, you, you'd be surprised how many people forget to put monitoring into a solution. We also need to think about security longer term. Um, one of my favorite uh, memes recently has been a self-driving car uh, in a circle of salt. Because the circle of salt was a solid white line from the perspective of the model, the car couldn't go anywhere. It was trapped in a summoning circle. And that's an example of adversarial behavior. When we have machine learning models in, uh, and making automatic decisions without human intervention, it becomes very easy for people to start working out how to gain the system. And in, we've got the, uh, like the facial recognition uh, stuff going on at the moment, and uh, people wearing glasses and things to do that. We need to think about robustness. How are we going to make sure that our models um, <laughs> end up with a safe conclusion for people when data might be missing. An area that I think we're going to need to do more of from the security side of things is red teams and blue teams. So businesses with a lot of security uh, concerns, they often have two teams. The red team tries to basically break into the company's systems. The blue team get uh, basically a load of, uh, tr try to keep the system secure. So as we're building, if we're going beyond uh, like a linear regression and building black box solutions and things that can be harder to understand, we should be looking at how we can actually exploit our model uh, and how we can protect our models. And it's going to become more and more important. So hopefully I've given you a huge to-do list. And we also have further to do for you. Uh, the bit.ly link, the ethical data science links, that has lots of uh, further reading on this topic. 
uh, so you can uh, read them on the metro and everything. You can get the slides, they're already on the GitHub. Um, and that's it. Thank you all very much. <laughs>